Hello. Hey guys. Uh, hi, Arthur. So, uh, hello, everybody. Hello. Uh, welcome. Uh, and thank you all for joining this live session of our DeFi MOOC, a massive open online course that is offered by the University of Nicosia as part of our DeFi series. It is with great pleasure uh, to introduce Arthur uh, Brightman, uh, co-founder of Tezos Foundation, uh, that will be joining us today uh, for a discussion on Tezos and you know, an overall discussion for the Tezos ecosystem in general. As you know, uh, Tezos is um, a decentralized open source proof of stake blockchain network uh, that facilitates peer-to-peer -peer transactions and it serves also as a smart contract platform with some very unique uh, features. And today uh, we'll be attempting uh, along with Arthur to find more uh, on the next milestones for Tezos and perhaps Arthur can share uh, some insight <laughs> info about, about Tezos, the Tezos ecosystem in general. So uh, hello, Arthur. Uh, hello. Thank you for joining. Um, My pleasure. So basically uh, we know that Tezos has several unique features. Um, one of the unique features of Tezos is, of course, the consensus uh, protocol, the mm -hmm. proof of stake model that utilizes by, by Tezos. And of course, the on-chain um, governance model that enables the, the protocol to amend, let's say, or self-organize or upgrade according to, to the votes of, of the users that are using the, mm -hmm. the network. Um, so what would you like to describe or elaborate a bit more um, also for the audience on, uh, you know, how, uh, how could you describe, for example, you know, Tezos, the Tezos ecosystem uh, to someone that, okay, uh, knows about Bitcoin, knows about Ethereum, but perhaps have never heard of, of Tezos, the Tezos ecosystem? Sure. Well, you know, if you know, uh, if you know about Bitcoin and Ethereum, I think you have a pretty good idea of what Tezos is. So, you know, before talking about the Tezos ecosystem, you know, let me talk a little bit about Tezos itself. Um, so like you mentioned, you know, Tezos is an open source software project. Uh, it's primarily a blockchain uh, platform. So similar to uh, um, Ethereum, um, it is a smart contract platform. So you can write uh, applications uh, on the chain, centralized applications uh, and all sorts of things. So it's, it's generally programmable. Uh, unlike uh, Ethereum, it uses a proof of stake uh, consensus, uh, the, the consensus mechanism is based on proof of stake, not on proof of work. So that's a, um, I would say that's, a, that's an important difference. And um, the other, um, one other important aspect of Tezos is that, um, like you mentioned, it has a specific governance model. And so just to sketch out, you could decide, you could, you could describe the, 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 the governance model of, uh, of Bitcoin as being primarily about um, Saying, well, we're not going to change the uh, the the consensus. Um, that sorry, we're not going to change the protocol. That's what it is. It's set in stone, never changing, or extremely slowly and uh, and, uh, and and in minimal ways. Uh, I would say in the Ethereum ecosystems, there's more the ethos of saying, "Hey, um, we're um, uh, you know, sorry, um, we're going to." Uh, Agree to uh, to um, to kind of change it at the same time and somewhat coordinate, but there's no formal process. And and, and and Tezos instead has a very very formal process where if you want to change, you have to uh, you have to basically agree uh, in a very formal manner in a verifiable way on the chain, and then it integrates automatically. So it lets us do a protocol of grades and evolution and innovation without hard forks. So um, that I think is something we have more in common with uh, uh, with Bitcoin. Uh, there's another aspect, which is um, Ethereum is based on, it has it, uh, the smart contracts in Ethereum are based on an assembly language called the EVM. So it's very low level. And the idea is like, let's try to have something very low level, very generic. Uh, we have a higher level VM, which, you know, and there's pros and cons to most models. So the, 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 the benefit that I see in having a higher level VM is that it makes it easier to re reason about the programs that are actually on the chain. Um, we can... Uh, target formal verification tools towards um, this higher level, uh, higher level language. It's closer to Bitcoin script. If you took Bitcoin script and made it typed and functional, you would basically get Mikkelsen, which is a VM for, for Tezos. Um, and it, it can be more efficient to interpret because you don't have to pay gas. You don't have to like measure the amount of gas you're taking at each, at each instructions because your instructions are larger instructions. Um, you could kind of look at that as a, a, a CISC risk framework for, for CPUs, you know, uh, 
Uh, we're trying to do like the specialized instructions that a lot of contracts are going to do, like checking a signature, as opposed to being very, very low level. So those are, you know, uh, I would say important differences. And in terms of um, the ecosystem itself, lots of similarities, of course, you know, you have uh, many entities in the ecosystem. Some of them are nonprofits. Uh, some of them are companies. Some of them, you know, build, uh, uh, do business uh, on the chain. Some of them build their entire business on the chain. So uh, it's, uh, it's eclectic. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur, for this uh, comprehensive uh, response. And actually, I will stand, um, you know, in one of the points that you mentioned with regards to the formal verification of formal verification capabilities of the protocol itself. And I will uh, attempt to relate that to some of the, uh, you know, issues or challenges that we have um, faced within the DeFi space. Uh, um, several challenges that um, caused due to human error on or bugs, let's say on smart contracts. Uh, we've seen several, you know, cases or pull rugs uh, or vulnerabilities exploited for from smart contracts. Mm -hmm. um, and one new idea uh, that perhaps could provide a solution uh, to the, uh, you know, um, identification, if you like or the prevention of deploying smart contracts that have, let's say, uh, bugs that are caused due to human error is using you know, uh, mathematical proofs uh, like formal verification models, et cetera. Uh, how do you think that Tezos, let's say, uh, as you mentioned, unique features, like the, the one uh, that relates to formal verification could facilitate a more robust, uh, you know, DeFi ecosystem, like more, more kind of more secure uh, DeFi ecosystem. Um, I mean, there's there's several levels here, um, uh, and, and obviously, security is a big um, um, has a big impact when when you have so much money at stake. And what what one uh, approach that I used to describe this is as you can look at um, you can look at um, the ratio between the amount of money that's at stake and the number of lines of code. So if you have 20 lines of code and $100 million at stake, one computation you can say is you can say, well, that's $5 million per line of code. And that's your budget for making sure, making sure the signs of, not exactly your budget, but you know what I mean. It's like, if it's if it's $5 million per line, maybe you should spend $1,000 know, of, of man hours per, time, per line reviewing the code. <laughs> Uh, and there are areas where you have this type of ratios um, before smart contracts. You've had things like aerospace, for example. You build a rocket, yes, there's a bunch of lines of code, but if, you're, if your rocket explodes, it's very, very bad. You know? First of all, you cannot fix a bug. And that's a big difference. You know, if, you, if you ship a social network and then you know, people, you know, they, they log in one morning and they don't see the picture of their friend's dog, it's bad and then you say oh no you know the system is broken you're going to fix it you lost some money because uh maybe you didn't show ads for like five minutes but like you're gonna you're gonna fix it you make a bug in a rocket and the rocket explodes there's no fixing the bug the rocket is exploded and and, and god forbid even if there's astronauts on the rocket that you know you have even had you can have even um, loss of human life and that has happened um that has happened to uh several aerospace programs um the one was uh with nasa and lockheed basically uh, had different uh, values. Some of them were counting in like uh, pounds per square inch and the other ones were uh, counting in pascals, like, uh, you know, regular normal people. And uh, because they were using different type of units, thing blew up. Same thing with Ariane. So the Ariane, um, um, the Ariane rocket uh, once blew up because it was using an older uh, field for measuring acceleration and they had an actual integer overflow because it was accelerating faster than the previous model. So it was accelerating so fast that the program thought, of, wait, wait a second, it's, it's going so fast, it's actually going the other way. So we have to turn and the rocket blew up. Um, and of course there's tons of lines of code, but it's also cost you billions of dollars when you have a rocket that blows up. So people started saying like, how, you know, how can we avoid bugs? And one technique which was developed um, in response to that has been formal verification. In formal verification, you try to use mathematical techniques to prove properties about your rocket. You might want to prove that you're always going to steer in the direction of acceleration or something of the sort. Now, formal verification doesn't mean you can't make any bugs. It's quite possible because maybe you're not exactly proving the right statements, you know, but you can learn a lot more from your mistakes. You can basically avoid entire classes of bugs because you prove these very wide properties 
um, that, 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 are, that you know, that wouldn't hold if you had bugs. So it's a very, very uh, powerful method for avoiding a bug. It's not, a, it's not foolproof, but it's much better than uh, just testing, for example, or code review. Now, smart contracts are exactly in this space. Smart contracts, I would say, maybe even better than aerospace. If you look at the, uh, the ratio of money to lines of code, um, definitely, you know, we're, you, you start, you know, you're seeing DEXs now which have a billion dollar uh, 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 TVL and they don't have as many, I'm, they don't have as many lines of code as, uh, as, as rockets do, right? So they're a perfect candidate for this, but we still don't see that technique very often. And it's part of that is because, well, the technique is, very, is still very um, labor intensive. It's still very complicated. And in particular, because it's a technique which is based on mathematics, it's a technique that's harder to apply if your language is further from mathematics. So the more mathematical your language is, the easier it is to, uh, to use a technique. And that was one of the design criteria for Mikkelsen, the, uh, the language of the smart contract in Tezos. We wanted it to be as easy as possible to use formal verification tools when using Mikkelsen. Small thing, for example, but in Mikkelsen by default, all the integers have arbitrary precision. You know, you don't have any overflow. And that has several, you know, there's a cost to that. There's going to be a little bit of overhead. It's going to be a little slower because, you know, uh, you call a library, you're not going to optimize it as just like one in one 64 bit instruction in the CPU. But what this overhead buys you is that people don't, don't shoot themselves in the foot by having overflow. What it buys you is that when you do formal verification, you don't have to worry about the possibility of overflow or any of that because you're working with an integer, which is, you know, a mathematical construct as opposed to uh, a, you know, a set of bits, which is much harder to, um, to reason about. So that's been one of the approaches that I think um, gives some security to, uh, uh, to the Tezos chain. There's other approaches. So for instance, you know, we, use, um, we use types uh, everywhere. The, avoiding type confusion in general doesn't prevent all bugs, but it does help you avoid entire categories of bug. More importantly, um, the contract call model. In Ethereum, if you're writing a contract, you call another contract, you're going, to, you know, you're going to jump into that other contract, and then when you're done, you're going to return. The problem is that you haven't necessarily saved your contract state, and so you might end up having reentrancy bug, like in the DAO. So you have to put reentrancy guard everywhere. And the, the, the model in Tezos is that if you want to call another contract, you don't call it in the middle of the contract. You're required, basically, to complete the execution of the contract and then at the end, you basically feel a, you know, an outbox uh, with a bunch of calls to, uh, uh, to, to, to other contracts. And in that model, it basically forces you to do all the housekeeping in your contracts so that you don't have to face, you, know, you don't have to uh, fall for reentrancy bug. It's still possible to write code that has reentrancy problems in Tezos. It's possible, but it's a lot harder. By default, you're going to, you're going to be nudged away from, uh, from this. So, um, you know, there have been contracts which were poorly written in Tezos that happens and, 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 and who have been exploited. So none of this is foolproof, but I do think that it makes it a lot easier for the developers who really care about the security of their program to actually get the properties that they want. Thank you so much, Arthur, for this uh, response. And I'm, I'm sure that this will trigger more questions from the crowd. Uh, and I think that we should be taking some questions in a bit. Um, but be before doing so, um, uh, let me, uh, you know, ask another question with regards to, um, to the general, let's say, um, milestone set and, you know, general, if you like, uh, roadmap of Tezos. Um, it seems that uh, the current cycle, let's say, of excitement nowadays in the blockchain crypto space, you know, is driven by DeFi, of course, and, you know, uh, we have NFTs now. And mm -hmm. we also experience, you know, some, you know, composability um, between, you know, DeFi and NFTs. And also uh, that is, you know, these new ideas with gamification and the play to earn platforms, et cetera. Mm -hmm. How do you think that Tezos, you know, wh where is Tezos position in this, you know, this space and, uh, you know, uh, considering the dimensions, uh, you know, DeFi, NFTs and, and, and gamification? You yeah, share your views with us to Sure, we, we've had a lot of attraction in the um, so you know there are DeFi applications on Tezos obviously uh, NFT uh, but all, uh, NFT is one area where specifically we've had a lot of uh, uh, a lot of traction. Uh, this was adopted by uh, the artist community, especially the 
AI journey of art community. Uh, and we have, we've had an explosion of, uh, uh, of NFTs on the chain, which has been a, uh, uh, which has been really cool to watch and very, uh, and very grassroots. So, uh, love that. I, I love the Tezos NFTs. Um, but these are mostly like art NFTs. Um, if we're going into gamification, um, I, I do think that we've only scratching the surface and that the, the, the best adoption for NFTs are going to come when they are tied into games. Um, and there's several projects in the Tezos space. For example, the game Emergence, which is being built by a company called Interpop, um, is quite interesting. Uh, but there's a few others uh, uh, in the area. Again, you know, I think it's still uh, very early days in, uh, uh, in this field. It's not, you know, at the end of the day, you know, how is Tezos positioned? Tezos is a fairly neutral platform, right? I don't, you know, I don't think you design a blockchain to be better for DeFi, to be better for NFTs. You're not really encountering this type of trade-offs. Um, by and large, you optimize for, you know, you want to optimize for general computation. It's not 100% true. Uh, I, 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 like, for example, um, state channels can work quite well for games and payments, but they're not yeah. going to work well for large financial applications. Rollups are going to work better for DeFi application where you want composability. Uh, a ZK rollup might work well for pure transactions, which might work you know, in a game where you're exchanging NFTs, but not something where smart contracts are important. So yeah, yes, there's a little bit of trade-off, but by and large, you know, I think what everyone wants is a platform which uh, where you can do a lot of transactions um, and, uh, and where the platform scales and we don't have to uh, uh, to pay very large fees and where the platform is secure. Um, and so in terms of positioning, I would say that doesn't come from, you know, Tezos itself as a, as a blockchain. It's more about what tooling do we want? And uh, it could be, for example, the wallets in the Tezos ecosystem. So several wallets in the Tezos ecosystem have started really showcasing NFTs, you know, being making themselves um, almost not necessarily NFT centric, but really giving them like a, a good front row seat in the wallet. Uh, so that's one way to position yourself. It's more around the, the, the tooling and the applications around the blockchain than the blockchain itself. Okay, uh, thank you, Arthur. Um, My pleasure. We have some, uh, you know, questions uh, from the crowd. Um, okay. Uh, I think that we have a bit, more, bit of time to go through the questions. Um, that is an interesting question with regards to uh, the centralization of POS-like systems. Yes. But the, you know, uh, the large holders, they could kind of influence, let's say, um, the POS system. What's, what's your opinion on, on that? I mean, you know, centralization, uh, centralization is always a force that you have to combat because it comes from efficiency, right? In general... Yeah very often you can cut costs by centralizing. There's very few things that uh, are gonna give you these economies of scale. In general, you talk about economies of scales, but these economies of scale do exist. So for example, large firms sometimes are not gonna do as well as small firms because they have a wider, you know, they have a bigger organization and so they have higher communication costs inside the organization. So that's a diseconomy of scale that can, uh, that can happen. Um, the question of centralization are seeing our, our question you can ask whether you're using proof of work or proof of stake, you know, um, can a large holder destabilize the consensus algorithm is a question you ask, you can ask about a large miner. You know, at one point, Ghash at IO had more than 51% of, uh, of the Bitcoin network. So you can have very large, uh, miners have a lot of weight. Um, and in, in the same way that you can have very large sticker. In general, I would think that you're going to sing a flatter distribution of coins than you would see a distribution of mining. I think mining is subject to um, more economies of scale. Mm -hmm. There's some these economies of scale in the sense that if you're in different locations, maybe you tap into more electricity. So there's a little bit of that in mining, but there's a lot of that in, in staking because ultimately these are volatile assets. And so you know, people are limited in their uh, willingness to hold a certain amount of volatile assets. And that by itself creates a these economies of scale, you know. So that's a, uh, that's one way to combat it. Exactly. The, and I guess that the, you know, the consensus algorithm itself, I mean, the randomization of the leader election, for example, could be kind of a mitigation or safeguarding mechanism that is embedded within the, the protocol itself, let's say, to to overcome this kind of, you know, well, you, you, you think. 
you can't really do that because you don't have a notion of identity, right? So, you know, the only identities that exist in the Bitcoin network is, uh, for when you come to consensus, is hash power. And the only identities that exist in the proof of stake network is like, you don't want to start saying like, oh, well, if you're a different staker, then because other than that, uh, so immediately stakers will just like split their keys into many different keys and uh, and you won't have any uh, any notion of who's who, so you can't you can't you can't count on like knowing which sticker is different from which sticker. You should just assume that there's stake, and that's and that's all there is to it. I would say what's the more relevant question is like what, what's a, you know what's a, what's the cost of an attack and what's a mitigation. Um, you know, even if you are a large staker and you have a lot of a sway, what can you actually do to the network? So you can censor. Mm-hmm. Um, you can start saying like, I'm, going, I'm not going to accept any other transaction on these transactions that I want. Um, and you can potentially re- reorganize a chain. Uh, yeah, they're, and, not, they're nothing at stake, let's say nothing at stake problem. It's kind of a possible attack. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we can talk about nothing at stake. So the idea of the nothing at stake is that you can, in theory, if you have a proof of stake system, by construction, it, it's not expensive to create blocks. So you start from the Genesis block and then you create another chain, which is different from the first one at, at no cost. And you just run this chain and run this chain and run this chain. And then a, a novice user who just joined the network for the first time, they can see many, many chains and they say, well, which one is the right one? You know, is it this chain or is it that chain? And I, I, think that's not a, uh, I think that's not a very compelling argument because if your chain has any success at all, there's no ambiguity as to which you know is right. And if you use as a means of payment, then basically you you know you go to see someone who accepts payments and they know what chains they want to be paid on, no question. So I don't think this ambiguity really really exists. Mm-hmm. And there's also a window of time where you can have something at stake. The point is you don't you don't want to require people to stake forever. They need to be able to unstake, right? But let's say that people are required to stake for one month to participate in consensus. What it means essentially is that you may not be able to distinguish two chains that diverge more than one month ago, because if they diverge one, more than one month ago, there could be nothing at stake. But if they diverge less than one month ago, then you can uh, assert penalties on the parties that, um, that cheated. Yeah, okay. Misbehave. So what it really comes down to is that if you have a global cataclysm and everything shuts down for an entire month, for an entire month, you don't have the network. And then after more than one month, the network comes up. Then you might not have, you know, like you go to your grocer and, and they say like, well, I'm on that chain and then you go to another person and on that chain, you, you, you kind of have chaos. But that's a very extreme situation where somehow you completely lose communication for a month over the entire world. And you might say, and someone might say, well, I'm going to see proof of work is better. But like so, that's a very minor property to care about. And there's a lot of benefits that you get from proof of stake, you know, lower inflation, lower cost. The fact, you know, uh, the fact that you can asymmetrically punish cheater um, you know, in proof of work, you basically have to reward everyone for being honest. Um, I'd much rather give a very small reward for running a node and then like have a harsh punishment for being dishonest. So there's there's so many benefits that I I, I think the, the small downside that you have in proof of stake don't really uh, um, not really justify um, the skepticism that, that 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 was initially around it, but it has largely waned today. I would say. Thank you, thank you, Arthur. Um, there is a question. Uh, let's let's uh, head in another question. Uh, there is a question by Carlos. Um, will there be any interchain interoperability between Tezos and other protocols or projects? Uh, it depends what we mean by interchain interoperability. I think many people have different things. Yeah. I mean, there, there are bridges, for example, you can wrap Ethereum tokens and use them on a Tezos chain. Mm-hmm. So I say, I guess yeah. that counts as inter- interoperability. Yes. Okay. Um, Maybe movements of, uh, let's say, states between, let, let's say, different chains or... Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the main states that people care to move today are token balances <laughs> yeah you know that that 99 <laughs> yes, exactly. of this of the, of the state you want you can do it so like the probably i would say the gold standard almost a gold standard in terms of like building bridges that has been done is probably yeah. the things that near has done with ethereum so mm-hmm. you know the near protocol embeds a light client for the ethereum chain um that will like receive so you get light lane security it will receive the blocks and so and it has a whole virtual machine and so it can know what's happening and like react and function it's neat from a technological standpoint i don't think it i don't but i don't think it actually like meets a uh, an actual demand uh, i think people are, are are happy to use much lighter um bridges or wrappers uh, that's number one and number two is a it's, it's real pain because Basically, anytime that Bitcoin, anytime that Ethereum changes, they have to change. 
So if Ethereum hard forks, they have to hard fork. If there's a bug in Ethereum, they have the bug. So it, it, it creates a very, very tight coupling, um, mm -hmm. which is um, which can be problematic. Exactly. So um, another question that relates to DeFi um, is whether you, you you would be able to provide us with you know some examples of some interesting like innovative DeFi applications that are currently being built on, on Tezos. Uh, yes, so there's a few, and you know, I will say, I will. There's there's DeFi and DeFi. You know, I, before yeah. summer of 2020, there were a few people talking about DeFi, and my definition, you know, like it was decentralized finance. You produce, you know, you're doing financial services, and you do it in a decentralized way, and you know, you had projects, for example, like MakerDAO or or Compound. You know, there's there are DeFi projects, and then it came to mean something quite different, which was, you know, farming. Uh, essentially, it's like, hey, there's this token, and the value prop of this token is that you can provide liquidity for it and get more of that token, um, which is kind of circular, doesn't go very good. Where. So we have those kind of projects, and uh, I'm not going yes. to tell you which is which. <laughs> I will let you find out. Yeah. But yes, there's a bunch of DeFi projects on Tezos. Uh, um, there's a synthetic asset platform called Use, for example. There's a uh, synthetic a US dollar a coin called Colibri. Um, they are also. Um, things called uh, uh there's a uh, plenty uh flame uh uh uh, uh spicy uh sex p s e x uh p um and there's uh oh I, I, sorry i'm i'm, I'm forgetting a uh, crunchy uh, okay. okay so there's 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 a bunch of uh, there's a bunch of them yeah so I, I, I guess that the question was answered i mean there is obviously an ecosystem of defi various defi applications have been currently used or built uh, using the Tezos protocol. Mm -hmm. um, let's take another question. Um, that is a question whether, do you think that, you know, it seems that the ecosystem is kind of, you know, uh, heterogeneous at the moment. I mean, we've seen many different projects uh, trying to, you know, different, let's say, blockchain protocols trying to differentiate themselves mm -hmm. from others by specializing, let's say, on particular, like either industrial applications or particular types of applications. Um, do you think that uh, we would be expecting this kind of fragmentation within the space, looking at different protocols that are specialized in, you know, particular topics or, you know, applications? I mean, if it happens, I don't think it'll happen because of, uh, of technology. Non, you know, I, I don't think we're going to say, oh, well, this chain is technology more suited for this, and this chain is technologically more suited for that. By and large, chains are going to be remain generic platforms. It could just happen by preferential attachments in the same way that you, know, um, you want to buy a violin in Paris, you go in the streets, and there's uh, 20 different violin shops. And they're all in the same streets. And the reason is because, you know, they know that if you want to buy a violin, you're going to go to that street. And so you should have your shop on that street otherwise. They're just going to go and, and browse the shops here. So you see this type of phenomenon anywhere. You know, you'll see these concentrations. Uh, why? Why are there so many like startups in in Silicon Valley, for example? And why are there so many VCs? So sometimes it's just this professional entrepreneurial mechanism, and so we might see some of that just because uh, I don't know. NFTs took off on Tezos, and all of a sudden, a lot of tooling was built for NFTs, made it, which made it easier for people to 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 do there. And so the buyers are there, the artists are there, and you have something that takes place and it's not necessarily due to the technology it's just it just happened so we may see some of that um because network effects are can be based you know just on just on uh, just on these things um we may see some of that i also think we may see some cluster some geographic clustering mm -hmm. uh, where you have regional winners uh but overall i i, I still think people underestimate the amount to which there's going to be consolidation mm -hmm. part of the reasons why uh we have a lot of blockchains today is like lack of scaling. Um, and I think scaling is going to change just to some extent uh, because if you're, you know, like if you're not worried about transaction costs, if you have plenty of transaction capacity, uh, then, you know, it, it, it becomes less, uh, you know, it, 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 incumbents become more, uh, more appealing. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I think it's, uh, you know, uh, we will see, of course, many, protocols uh, as we currently observe that are positioning themselves as like bridges or solving the interoperability issues or challenges, mm -hmm. scaling, different scaling solutions, et cetera. Uh, so, and, and also I, I think I, I have to agree with you that at the end of the day, it's kind of how, how do you build the network effects and 
what's the motives about certain communities building certain projects. Mm -hmm. So, um, thank you so much, Arthur, uh, for my pleasure. This session. Uh, if you if you would like to, you know, conclude with a just a single final statement for for our uh, uh, students uh, that participate today, I would say that uh, you know uh, a lot of. Uh, you don't you don't necessarily near as you know hear as much about Tezos in Telegram rooms or on Twitter, but uh, we do have a quite a vibrant uh, um, uh, ecosystem. We've had thirty uh, percent months over months growth in smart contract calls almost since January. So it's it's been a lot of uh, it's been a lot of ramp ups, and, and we do have a lot of um, good libraries and tooling for um, building smart contracts. So if you haven't you know, uh, think outside of the EVM. If you haven't had a, uh, a, a chance to try and build a, a, a contract in the ecosystem, give it a give it give it, give it a try. Um, it's really cool. Uh, there's a great community. Um, it's very easy to get help. Um, everyone's very friendly uh, and, and trying to help each other out. So, uh, give it a shot. It's really nice. So thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Uh, it was very fruitful. Uh, I think for everybody. My so, pleasure. Uh, Wishing you all the best and we keep in touch. Um, thank, thank you. Bye-bye. You. Thank you. So, um, so guys, um, we will be resuming uh, our session uh, with the slide decks for today's uh, live session. And we will also be, um, you know, taking several of your questions. Uh, we also gather those questions, and we will be responding to um, to your questions uh, that we gathered from the Moodle forum. Uh, so let me uh, share by my, my screen. Um, also, uh, Manos Pabangelo will be joining me today, um, and also Lambis Dionisobulos will be facilitating uh, your question answering and, and the administrative stuff with regards to the communication in the Discord channel. Hey, everyone. Hello. Do not forget to join our Discord channel. And as always, feel free to post your questions in the uh, Moodle forum, and we will be providing responses to uh, your questions. So, um, I will be sharing my screen. Um, so uh, I will start from you know session one, and I guess I, I can skim through the slides and take more questions as we go. As you know, DeFi, De DeFi is kind of more like a, a movement, let's say, like an ideolo ideology, uh, but set that leverages, as we mentioned previously, uh, several decentralized pro pro blockchain networks uh, in order to, if you like, evolve or transform traditional financial products into what we refer as permissionless, trustless, and transparent protocols that run over these decentralized and distributed networks uh, without the facilitation of some third party. And the DeFi space in general landscape has evolved uh, throughout the last years into a vast space of many services and products and, of course, opportunities. Uh, in this slide deck, we, uh, of course, couldn't cover or capture the entire spectrum of those opportunities. Uh, however, we will be focusing on the DeFi stack, on the various layers, if you like, that support the development of innovative DeFi products. Of course, the, the content of this slide deck is on, only for educational and informational purposes. And um, it, could, it should not be uh, construed as, uh, you know, uh, as material or uh, investment advice. Therefore, we will be focusing only into the academic uh, side of things. So let me jump into the DeFi stack very quickly. Um, so the DeFi stack uses uh, this kind of multi-layer architecture uh, where each particular layer plays its own role within the DeFi stack. And we have this kind of composable, if you like, structure that we can use different parts and build uh, new innovative applications. And this financial ecosystem in general 
It builds on, of course, blockchains that are smart contract enabled. Uh, and there are several advantages, such as the transparency that is offered, the auditability that is offered in these new products and services. Uh, however, we've seen that cases of the initial DeFi applications uh, and several challenges stemming from scalability. And we've seen how several solutions uh, in the space of layer two solutions or improvements to layer one have captured or attempted to provide an equilibrium, let's say, to this idea of the blockchain trilemma and the challenges of the blockchain trilemma. Then we have this, you know, different uh, uh, opportunities with smart contracts that, as I've said, eliminated the need of trusting some intermediary. Um, we, we've seen how um, several uh, applications are also utilizing Oracle, Oracle networks in order to provide more, uh, if you like, secure price feeds on the data. And we've seen several decentralized applications that are built uh, using this uh, DeFi stack. And of course, we've seen how these applications have also been made interoperable in most of the cases. So we will be uh, reviewing these, uh, if you like, layers, uh, starting from the settlement layer, of course, which consists of the actual blockchain backbone that fuels these kind of applications. Uh, we've seen um, how uh, this layer settles the transactions and also provides the secure execution of the, you know, um, and also act as a, as a dispute resolution mechanism to these applications. And of course, there are so many uh, settlement layers nowadays. Um, each layer has its own pros and cons, let's say, its own features and capabilities, and depending on the applications and design requirements. However, there are, yeah, there are too many to analyze in, in a single slide deck. Um, the second layer is the, if you like, the asset layer, um, what we refer here as the, the second layer of the DeFi stack, which mostly um, consists of the assets, uh, if you like, uh, or the types of assets that we can issue or build on top of the settlement layer. And of course, this layer includes the native, if you like, uh, token uh, of, the pro of the protocol, as well as you know, the capabilities of introducing additional assets that are issued uh, with the use of the settlement layer. And here we could classify the different types of, uh, of tokens, like the, the ones we have, like with the ERC20 or the ERC721, different types on, in the Ethereum, if we assume the Ethereum blockchain. So moving forward, uh, as I said, we, we have the native tokens and the tokens that are built uh, using the various standards as templates on top of these uh, settlement protocols. And there are uh, several different token standards in each ecosystem and each blockchain protocol, let's say. Uh, here in this slide, we're referring to uh, some token standards as an indicative sample of those uh, token standards referring to the Ethereum blockchain. And and depending on the uh, requirements here, uh, there are different types of uh, standards that are used to build uh, either fungible or non-fungible type of tokens or a combination of, of the two. And we have um, an evolving, let's say, space uh, of the various uh, standards that are built on top of uh, layer one uh, protocols. There is also this idea of governance tokens that are mainly used as a mechanism uh, that enables the communities to collaborate and decide about the future of uh, some decentralized protocol, let's say. We've seen several examples of such tokens, uh, mostly from the uh, decentralized autonomous organization space. Um, and, and many DeFi products are utilizing um, other specialized or purpose, specialized purpose uh, tokens um, in order to incentivize or contribute the rewards to the various users that are contributing uh, in those DeFi uh, products or services. Like for example, we have the liquidity provider tokens, which are responsible uh, kind of to represent the shares of individuals in those liquidity pools. 
There's also the protocol layer, and this is the layer that provides the various standards uh, for building specific use cases of decentralized applications. And there are different types here. We have decentralized exchanges, we have debt markets, derivatives, we have on-chain asset management. And these standards are usually uh, implemented with the use of smart contracts and can be accessed by any user. Um, and this is what we refer to as the, uh, you know, the DeFi kind of composability stack where you can mix and match various types of um, those standards in order to build more complex um, DeFi applications. Um, moving forward um, to the next layer, this is the application layer that if you like creates the uh, UIs, the interactive environment of the individual protocols. And this allows the users to interact with those applications and making uh, those applications easier to use. And there are different uh, types of user interfaces that are built there. And finally, moving to the aggregation layer, which is of course considered here as an extension of the application layer where uh, these kind of uh, aggregators, as we call them, create um, more user-centric platforms that enable users to connect to several applications and protocols and making it more easier for users to use these complex platforms rather than connecting to each individual platform. Um, in this case, with, using the aggregators, you can uh, simultaneously uh, connect and combine various services together. And there are a couple of examples in the space, uh, such as the indicative examples we present here, Zapper and in, uh, Instant, Instap, which uh, provide several uh, aggregator opportunities for the various applications. So in general, we've seen that DeFi, um, it's you know this multi-layer architecture uh, where, uh, as we discussed, each layer has a distinctive um, you know, purpose in the, this layer architecture. And uh, the way that these layers are com uh, composed together, they create an open, let's say, in a highly composable infrastructure that enables the generation of more applications uh, and allows for more use cases to be built using these uh, different layers. Um, various projects can just compose this, as we call the uh, DeFi puzzles, into a more complex, uh, you know, uh, financial product that uses different features or combines different features and characteristics from uh, the various layers. And this is what we refer to as the, the Lego box, where uh, each, you know, DeFi product uh, could resemble, let's say, uh, a Lego piece, and uh, where this Lego piece could uh, be combined with other Lego pieces in order to uh, create a more complex, more unique uh, application. And um, this is uh, what we refer as the Lego box, as, as we mentioned. Um, so there is huge potential of combining the various features and create new, if you like, unimaginable products or services. Uh, in the DeFi universe. And this slide indicates some examples of uh, applications that are built on uh, by using a combination of the various Legos or composable elements as we call them in the DeFi space. So uh, there are huge opportunities in this space. Um, so I, I would be concluding this uh, slide deck and uh, I would be taking uh, some questions uh, before we proceed to, uh, to the next uh, slide deck. Uh, also, Mano, uh, please feel free to uh, elaborate if you like in this concept. So, yes, of course. Um, so, <clears throat> you want to uh, go to the questions that was posted uh, were posted in the forum? First yes, of let's, all? let's take some and questions, then, uh, and then we move so on. That we can uh, have a bit of time to go through the uh, next slide deck, uh, just in some indicative slides, so that we can. Uh, okay, so um, let me find uh, maybe some questions uh, that from the forum that are, are uh, according to the 
the first session. So we have uh, Rippert saying hi. And so the that, there was one question, um, Manu, if I may, yeah. that relates to the terminology that is being Yes, correct. Uh, this is what I'm referring to. Um, as you know, uh, there are several situations, depending on the context, that we utilize the same term, but we define something different. So in this case, we have been referring to the DeFi stack, okay, and not the actual blockchain protocol. And in our DeFi, DeFi stack, the blockchain protocol maps to the settlement layer. So I just wanted to mention that to avoid any confusion. So okay. um, um, yes, uh, this was uh, the first um, question. The last question what, uh, was posted from uh, Rippert. Then uh, we have um, maybe uh, another question from Jay Tiktaman in the Q&A uh, uh, that says, currently applications emerging seem to replicate existing financial products and services. I would appreciate it if you could share any uh, disruptive business models emerging using DeFi, for example, distributed financial inclusion uh, yes. solutions. Uh, yeah. I'm not so, gonna point, due to the academic neutrality of this session, I'm not going to point people to specific protocols. But I guess that one of the most innovative kind of products, or if you like, and differentiation of those DeFi products compared to the traditional financial products is the way that these protocols are performing governance. And we've seen how um, incentives uh, with the use of governance tokens have been used in order to drive the evolution of particular DeFi products. And we've seen how uh, those, uh, if you like, financial products or services are structured uh, with a kind of a, in a decentralized autonomous organization way, like an like DAO uh, kind of uh, model, which um, in my opinion, um, presents a, a new dimension to these DeFi products that differentiates them from traditional finance, from as we call them, TradFi. Um, so I would like, uh, there, is, uh, there is an interesting question by Thomas with regards to this uh, perspective that Legos could be combined. Yeah, um, combining I would the, like, the uniqueness. I would like maybe to yeah. add uh, also to the previous question. Yes, yeah. Uh, that so, uh, I think for me also, of course, governance uh, very the way government is supposed to be done in uh, DeFi is very innovative, uh, very uh, new, and different from uh, the centralized finance. But I think one big innovation of generally um, DeFi's ecosystem is that it allows that everyone can be the bank, can be and offer financial services, not just to participate as in central finance, but in central finance, we go to the bank, we go to the markets and we use the markets. But in, in DeFi, you can be the market, you can lend, you can uh, uh, stake your liquidity in order for others to trade. You can al also create finance, not just use it. I think that's for me, it's a very big, you know, innovative point of, uh, of DeFi in general. Thank you, Manu. Um, so let's, let's take a few more questions before we uh, proceed with the session. Um, so uh, there is a question with regards to uh, this idea of semi, uh, let's say semi-fungible tokens. Um, I guess I could elaborate on this um, very briefly. So semi-fungible tokens uh, are kind of proposed as a new kind of group of tokens, a, a new standard of tokens that uh, could be uh, both fungible and non-fungible um, at the same time during their, or during their life cycle, let's say. Uh, so for example, um, if we, we could consider a, a semi-fungible token at the beginning being traded as a, regu, a regular, let's say, regular fungible token, but then it could be traded also uh, as, uh, you know, as a non-fungible token. Um, so for example, uh, let's say that we, we have like a, a, ticker, a ticket or a, or a voucher, let's say, that uh, 
would have the same, let's say, value as some other identical, let's say, voucher with the same, you know, uh, expiration date or whatever. Um, and therefore, this could be interchangeable. Um, so uh, I guess one of the special types of, you know, one of the special characteristics of semi-fungible tokens is that uh, once they, let's say, redeemed, um, then they they will lose their, their fungibility, let's say. Um, so this could be uh, kind of an example of a semi-fungible uh, token. Um, let's move on to the next question, maybe, um, from okay. uh, uh, Thomas Blankbet. Uh, he asks, uh, Lego seems dangerous, combining all the weaknesses of all the protocols uh, be combined. Um, maybe I elaborate uh, in this um, yes, and please. say that uh, similarly in, um, in centralized finance, for example, if you have a portfolio with uh, different, uh, let's say, um, dangerous uh, stocks, then of course your your portfolio will be um, uh, very affected by it if everything fails. But um, the good thing with DeFi is that um, as you as we see in the stack that the trust factor normally goes to the settlement layer to the top layer which is the blockchain and most of the cases, especially in the theory games, it's it's uh, it stood up really good, uh, really well uh, uh, here. But what uh, DeFi offers is the opportunities for you to choose on where you want to to expose yourself or when to uh, what what exactly finance service you want from uh, from the ecosystem so uh, it's it's term of choice of course there are risky protocols up there but um, yeah all of them also, are Mano, uh, do not forget the the transparency that is offered by these defi products uh, meaning that if you if you combine the weaknesses of several protocols together, then the, you know, network effects, the, the communities that uh, are observing this and the transparency that is offered by, uh, by this kind of products will self-exclude your service. Uh, and, I, and I guess that the, the answer here is the, you know, the uh, transparency, which is acting as, as a mechanism for this, 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 um, excluding those risky, let's say, services or products. Uh, okay, let me take another one uh, with regards to the EVM compatibility, uh, whether it is important to the present DeFi space. Of course, uh, many um, many products are, are built using the Ethereum virtual machine. It seems that the Ethereum virtual machine has been the de facto standard for many um, blockchain protocols out there. Although we've seen that there are also um, uh, thoughts of uh, evolving from the moving away from the Ethereum virtual machine to WebAssembly, for example, for some protocols, even, even for the new version of Ethereum. Uh, but I guess that in general, uh, the EVM has uh, evolved and matured the space, the device space. Um, and also the characteristic that many um, blockchain protocols are using EVMs uh, enables, you know, maybe the kind of the interoperability of various applications that are built for one protocol and then move and migrate to another protocol. So um, thank you so much for the questions. Uh, I guess so we move to the move on to the uh, to the next slide deck. Yes, correct. Uh, and most of the questions uh, on the forum are based on the second one. So yeah. Great. Let's so move, that we uh, so that we get a bit of time at the end to go through the uh, Moodle questions. If we if we do not have enough time, uh, we will be posting uh, responses to your questions in the Moodle form. And also for everyone, the, the its answer wasn't completed in the live session because we cannot cover. All of them, unfortunately, uh, we can uh, contact us in uh, the Discord. As we said, me and Labis are uh, <laughs> most of the hours of the day on theirs, and we will uh, be there to answer any of your questions if we can. Okay, uh, thank you, Mano. Uh, let's move on to uh, the second slide deck for today, uh, where we will be attempting to cover some, you know, DeFi infrastructure at the settlement layer. 
Um, can you can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so in this slide deck, we uh, will be going through uh, some indicative examples of layer one protocols. Uh, we uh, are touching base on some indicative set uh, since we, we are not able to cover everything. Um, so uh, moving to, to this slide, uh, we've seen that since the, if you like the inception of Bitcoin and Ethereum uh, uh, in general, um, we've seen many different blockchain protocols being proposed. And the blockchain Trilema that was coined by Vidalik uh, triggered, if you like, an explosion of various blockchain protocols. Um, different blockchain protocols proposing their own innovative solutions uh, to the blockchain Trilema and attempting, in essence, to bridge the gap and provide you know, alternative solutions. So in general, uh, the, the Trilema raised uh, the blockchain's inability, if you like to achieve a kind of harmonization to the coexistence of the, the three dimensions, scalability, security, and decentralization. And we've seen that uh, in these attempts, many uh, different blockchain protocols have evolved. And uh, in the research uh, topics, we've seen um, different proposals to, to emerge. So there is this set nowadays of layer one protocols and layer two protocols that have been uh, emerged in order to support applications that require uh, long gas fees and transaction, uh, high transaction throughput with uh, low latency. So uh, there are different kinds of scaling uh, solutions out there. And we've seen several scaling solutions also be combined with uh, the ideas of interoperability. Um, we've seen notary schemes, side chains, relays. Uh, we've seen hash locking schemes, uh, payment channels, off chain payment channels, etc. And uh, also we, we've seen also improvements on consensus algorithms, uh, moving from the Nagamoto proposal to some alternative, more, if you like, scalable consensus algorithms and different families of consensus algorithms, either evolved uh, through Byzantine fault tolerance kind of family of algorithms to uh, new ideas like proof of stake and delegated proof of stake, etc. Um, in general, the you know the the blockchain blockchain based you know distributed system is utilizing um, a consensus algorithm uh, for. Uh, ensuring uh, that there will be a unified agreement between the parties that participate to the network to most of the cases uh, ensure fairness, uh, to enable fault tolerance, and to, in general, to, to ensure that everyone plays uh, along with the rules of the protocol. So basically, and here we, we've seen how uh, incentives, uh, economic or other incentives related also to the, uh, how the, the, the consensus algorithms work and reward the uh, honest participation to the network. And starting from the uh, Nagamoto consensus, we've seen uh, how this civil protection mechanism was influenced by hash, hash as uh, we know it from the literature. And uh, we've seen uh, how a, a symbol, um, however robust algorithm could be built based on the computational power of the nodes that participate to the network. Uh, to establish a consensus mechanism that um, enables the, the honest participation of users and at the same time ensures that ensures data integrity of, of the information. So in Nagamoto consensus, I mean, if we could uh, define a model for the Nagamoto consensus, we could say that uh, it's a protocol that it, it does not matter uh, who, who you are in the protocol, but you get judged by, uh, by what you do in the protocol. Whereas in the traditional, let's say, BFT family of algorithms, where a small group of uh, nodes are participating to the consensus, uh, but uh, of course, uh, there are no binding kind of contracts to follow, let's say. Um, 
So moving forward, uh, this is kind of an overview of the Nagamoto consensus, where each node in the network is calculating the hash value of the block headers. Miners then attempt to change the nonce frequently, brute forcing this to get a different hash value until this value uh, that results is equal or smaller uh, to a given target. The process, of course, repeats until it hits that target value. And in such case, the node broadcasts the, the block to the other nodes along with the nodes in order to verify uh, and mutually agree upon the correctness of the hash value. This is Nagamoto consensus. Moving forward, the proof of stake kind of family of algorithms. Um, briefly to say that such algorithms try to reach uh, you know, consensus not through uh, brute force and doing physical work, but uh, mostly by voting, uh, by voting uh, for transactions by validators and weighting those votes uh, on the stake uh, that they have in the system. Therefore, in this model, securing uh, a valid state of the blockchain is not a computational in in intensive and therefore it does not require huge uh, energy uh, resources. Um, and also it's uh, much faster and expensive uh, in terms of processing. However, in this model, as we discussed previously, uh, several challenges have been shifted from solving uh, the difficult puzzle to selecting uh, suitable and reputable nodes as validators in the network. And we've seen different implementations of this uh, variation of POS. Uh, so basically, POS select in each, uh, let's say, round a node that will be uh, creating a new block depending on the, uh, let's say, health stake of that node rather than the computational power. And uh, there is still a, a kind of a, a puzzle that needs to be solved, but it's not that uh, computational intense. There are also this idea about delegated proof of stake, which is kind of similar to POS. Uh, the major difference is that um, the participants could delegate their stake to elect other block verifiers, and then these block verifiers are proposing um, the next uh, block to be added to the chain. So very briefly, uh, the main principle of um, delegated proof of stake is that nodes that hold some stake elect some block verifier um, to create you know, a block. And this way, um, uh, the voting makes you know, or assigns the uh, responsibility of creating blocks to, uh, to the ones that have been delegated by other users. And there are, of course, various variations of, um, of this idea. And we've seen also some other innovative ideas being evolved in this space, such as the proof of authority, for example, which is based on a reputation rather than a stake kind of, um, uh, if you like, uh, characteristic for determining the um, block generation. Um, the, the, this was an algorithm that was um, proposed by, by Gavin uh, back in 2017, if I remember correctly. Um, and it leverages you know, the reputation and the identity of the nodes, then block validators rather than stake, stake coins. So basically they stake their reputation instead, instead of staking the, the tokens. Um, so the blockchain trilemma you know, created several challenges and several new solutions have been proposed as, you know, attempts to solve um, these dimensions, these challenges. Um, and it's been, you know, a hard problem um, because you have, you know, the decentralization dimension um, that instead of, you know, having some single entity in governing the network, you need to preserve decentralization and equality of all participants to the network. You have security that you need to prevent malicious actors from taking over the network. And of course, you have the ideas of scalability uh, where you will, you will need to be able to perform large throughput of transactions in low latency 
uh, without uh, you know increasing gas fees and transaction times. So that is there is a set of uh, you know uh, different consensus protocols in the literature, each one with its own unique characteristics and, and features. So um, Mano, would you like to uh, take over this uh, next part of the of the session? Uh, yes. Um, yes, I, I will. I will. I will keep the slides rolling. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, really briefly, um, um, we we saw Ethereum on the last um, uh, last week's lecture. Um, it's the dominant power, I think, in my opinion, generally in DeFi as a consensus protocol. Uh, we'll go through really quickly the um, uh, the slides here. So. Uh, we, we have the, your questions um, after. So uh, as you know, Ethereum is uh, running currently proof of work, but uh, it aims at the end of the year and or in the beginning of the next to transit, transiting the new protocol uh, proof of stake. So it stains all of the, all of the consensus. Um, the next one uh, he will be uh te yes tezos that uh, we uh, we clearly saw in um, uh, and we discussed with his uh, its founder actually so let me also have the slides here yeah uh so tezos uh, as you saw was uh, uh, more or less introduced in 2014 and it runs a liquid proof of stake algorithm which is, is uh, different than, uh, than the normal proof of stake and uh, it has some uh, metrics such as, uh, such as 40 transactions per, per second, 30 seconds per block time. And uh, so the, of course, the self augmenting uh, decentralization benefits that we discussed also previously. Um, DeFi in Tezos, we have some uh, basic applications with uh, stable coins, with uh, De uh, decentralized exchanges and uh, of course lending and borrowing platforms uh, you can see more of the list in the link uh, that we we have in the presentations then we uh, another famous platform is cardano cardano uh, was uh, launched in 2015 from a co uh, actually from a Ethereum co-founder uh, Charles uh, Hunt, uh, Hankson is, uh, uh, I think, its ICO um, is the most valuable proof of stake algorithm up there currently, and uh, yeah, it holds uh, many applications. And uh, currently, it, it was, I think, uh, in the middle of uh, of September that it launched the smart contracts capabilities. So now it's starting to get into the to the DeFi ecosystems because uh, DeFi uh, uh, protocols need uh, smart contracts and some applications are uh, include of uh, Meld uh, Cody which it's co collaborating with uh, with Cardano is not actually it's it's not hundred percent and Liquid of course and we see the full ecosystem in the next slide. As you can see, then is Avalanche, another uh, platform. It's, it's uh, more new than the previous one. And it uh, actually has uh, its own consensus algorithm, which is called uh, Avalanche Consensus just, up there. And uh, just, yeah, to, uh, just to add on the, on the Avalanche uh, consensus algorithm, which is quite interesting in terms of uh, you know its research characteristics um, here. Uh, in this protocol, uh, we've seen that uh, the founders, they, they, they have been trying to combine, if you like, the uh, some of the features of Nagamoto consensus, which is the robustness, the scalability in, in terms of the number of nodes that could participate, not the number of transactions. I mean, the, that it is an open protocol that could scale up to uh, thousands of, uh, of nodes participating in the consensus. And of course, then the centralization. Uh, combining those characteristics with classical PFT, let's say, consensus algorithms that, of course, they have more speed, they have quick finality, they are energy efficient. And actually, Avalanche is considered a voting probabilistic protocol for consensus. And where um, validators, they, they hear for transactions, and then they vote whether a transaction is accepted or, or rejected. 
Um, and each validator, validator in this system is considered as an independent decision maker. And there is no leader election in this uh, consensus algorithm, which makes this solution very, very uh, interesting in terms of, of the research aspects. And it seems that it scales quite well. It, it uses uh, this idea of uh, repeated random sampling in order to find in the subset of nodes that will be participating uh, to the consensus and validating the transactions. And recently they, they came up with, with a lot of you know, different, uh, uh, different ecosystems. I mean, different products and services are currently being built in and, and on, this, on this ecosystem. Uh, okay, that's all from my side, Manu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let's move Solana. On to Solana briefly. Uh, Solana uses a combination of proof of stake and proof of history. Actually, we had a question regarding that. So proof of history, how it works. Uh, imagine, I will give you a similar uh, example. Imagine a glass of milk and a drop of color, uh, of a food coloring. If you drop the, the food coloring in and you have plenty of images, timeline, how it changes the color from, let's say, white to blue, then you can order the, um, uh, the different pictures on them on themselves uh, because of the of entropy uh, so it's similar the, the idea is similarly but uh, but in so in proof of history instead of having the nonce so in proof of work we have uh, it's a validator tried to changing the notes nonce and find the correct answer now the each answer comes with the separate time uh, timestamp uh, id let's say so um this helps uh, in order to be faster, so you don't need to communicate with the old network and having the precise nonce because you know the time. The time is uh, uh, absolute in, the, in terms of proof of history. Uh, so for consideration, so we have the timestamp and this is how the hashing works and how the consensus work. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a really fast network and with a lot of uh, capabilities and uh, future DeFi, uh, hopefully, platforms. Then finally, we included also Binance Smart Chain, which uh, uses its own uh, proof of stake authority, which actually give um, uh, authorization for, for being um, a validator on the network. Uh, also, uh, Binance Smart Chain has a lot of applications on it, the DeFi applications right now, and its, the, its speed is characterized quite, uh, quite high. Uh, let's um, let's discuss about scaling solutions next. Um, uh, so, if we scaling solutions is back to the trilemma, right? It's the, the one side of the trilemma, which is uh, how scalable it is, how how fast something can be, and uh, if we see uh, the solutions in the next slide uh, with the, uh, the graphs from uh, a beautiful paper that we uh, we included below. We have three major columns of uh, scalization uh, solutions. So we have second layer, which is the layer two solutions that we talk about in the in this session as well. The first layer is sharding solutions and uh, other solutions. So sharding solutions, most of them contain uh, changing the uh, the consensus protocol more or less, and uh, um, the the other solutions it's having totally different, let's say, protocols, uh, like uh, a, a directed asymmetric graph, which is uh, the, the, the techniques are totally different with proof of stake, let's say, it's um, new methodologies. So- I know, just, as, just, to add, yeah. just, just for clarity, I just wanted to comment that there are several factors that concern the scalability in a blockchain protocol. The first factor is, of course, throughput, which is the number of confirmed transactions per second. The second factor is storage. So imagine that we are uh, keeping uh, the ledger in our local machines. Uh, all the transactions are recorded in the blockchain, and therefore the size increases. Okay, So this will create a huge demand in terms of storage. And it will, of course, increase the time that is needed to synchronize and download the chain. So it's an important factor. Another factor that uh, you know influences scalability is, of course, the cost. What is the cost uh, to confirm a transaction? 
So the users, they, they, they pay some fees to use the network and then the, the validators are expecting some incentives in order for them to, be, to participate to the networks. So cost is also uh, an additional factor that influences scalability. And lastly, I just wanted to say, uh, we have latency. Uh, latency is also referred as the, if you like, the, the confirmation time, okay? So the time that is needed between submitting a transaction to the blockchain and the first confirmation of acceptance by the consensus. Therefore, these factors are essential when we're discussing scalability in uh, blockchain protocols. Yes, Corey, thank you for the addition, Kletos. Um, yes, so um, the last, uh, the confirmation speed, it's the speed, speed of transaction in the uh, very uh, oversimplified. So yeah, the layer one solutions, as we said, it's the consensus algorithm improvements. So as we described in the first part uh, by, by Clitos, different consensus protocols have different, let's say, trilemma balances and uh, benefits and, of course, drawbacks. Sharding solutions, um, which uh, uh, it's uh, more or less, I, I think, um, Clitos is better on explaining uh, sharding. I think it's, it's a bit expert, uh, but it's uh, uh, dividing the. So si simply the put, uh, simply yes. put, sharding is being used, uh, you know, as a scaling solution to distribute the databases, and we we've seen that this uh, kind of scaling solution is currently being reutilized, if you like, in the blockchain space in order to uh, facilitate scalability, uh, you know, challenges uh, to solve the, as, as a solution to scalability of, of blockchain protocols. Very briefly, um, the idea is to divide the, the state of the chain and also, I mean, the, the consensus to various uh, groups, as we call them, the shards where each node is um, responsible for validating and verifying the transactions within its own shard. Okay, and in this way, you are scaling horizontally um, the capabilities of the network, and therefore you are expecting um, higher transaction throughput uh, with low latency. Of course, there are other challenges here. One of the challenges is that you need to make sure that the, that the the percentage of um, Byzantine fault tolerance within the shard uh, still remains within the acceptable levels. Um, and of course, this is a, a great, great topic for discussion. Yes, thank you for the addition. Also, we have the asymmetric graphs, which is a different technique, uh, oversimplified uh, in order to finalize the transaction. It's not has to finalize another two transactions, for example. But uh, yeah, it's oversimplification. Yes, this, this, um, this is the idea mostly being used by IOTA. IOTA, yeah. However, there are other um, instantiations, let's say, of direct recycling graphs. For example, one instantiation is uh, we've seen the literature with Spectre as a, a proposal to the scaling solution of Bitcoin, let's say. Another uh, instantiation is the uh, instantiation by Obite, previously Byteball. And another instantiation uh, is presented by, by, Hash, by Hashgraph, which also offers um, a kind of a gossip protocol that also facilitates the uh, kind of uh, the, um, uh, the confirmation of transactions to much um, uh, quicker times. So these topics yeah, are thank you. quite technical, uh, but not Yes, uh, <laughs> and we like it technical. That's why we over uh, talked yes. about it. <laughs> we over elaborated. Yeah, so so yeah, yeah, moving yeah, forward, elaborate. Manu, let's uh, yes. elaborate a bit on this slide. Yes, uh, um, so layer two solutions um, are, uh, as it said, it's layer two, um, which means we, they sit on top of uh, the consensus protocols, the, the, uh, the chain, let's say, and what they're trying to solve it's the the trilemma especially the speed part and the throughput part uh, of the transactions because all of the operations let's say they are becoming off chain and all the trust and authentication they are given to the private let's say uh, layer two hands uh, two great examples are uh, bitcoin lightning network which uh, 
uh, offers faster and uh, let's say uh, faster transactions yeah. on the network. It came in and channel lowers, or yes, or yes. And now Arbitrum also, which is uh, uh, interoperability layer too, so it doesn't have to do with uh, speed or, or throughput. Uh, if we move to bridges, um, uh, bridges are uh, can be considered a layer two, let's say, but uh, they're not uh, there to to solve the trilemma. And I'm saying that because we had a similar uh, question actually uh, from uh, from the from the forum. So uh, they are there to connect, not to solve. Let's say. Uh, so let me yes. let me elaborate a bit on this uh, topic, Mano. So at the abstract level, um, we could say that uh, we could, if you like, define and bridge as kind of a system that facilitates the transfer of information between one, one or more chains. And in this case, we can define information as, for example, uh, state, uh, uh, the, st the, st the state of, um, of the data, uh, this could be contract calls, it could be uh, referring to tokens or assets, uh, it could refer to proofs, etc. And there are several conditions um, and components that uh, components that um, um, bridges utilize. Uh, for example, um, if I could uh, name a few, uh, firstly, uh, there are some components that are doing monitoring, meaning that uh, there is uh, some oracle, some uh, validator, or, or sometimes they, they are referring to this oracle as a relayer, which is responsible to monitor the state between the, the source chain and, and the side chain, let's say, or, or the, the other chain, or, or the other chain that we are transacting to. Uh, there is, you know, uh, several ideas on message passing and relaying um, how, how, to how to transfer an event or trigger an event uh, from one chain to another. Uh, there is, of course, the consensus, uh, which is required by uh, the monitoring actors in order to reach agreement within the scope of the information that is being exchanged. And of course, we have the cryptographic signatures that are utilized by, the, by those protocols, by those bridges, uh, bridges to, to make sure that the, the information is signed before uh, it arrives to the destination chain. So there are different components and it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a, of a complex system. Um, and we've seen in the literature that, that the, there are different examples of this kind of bridges for different ecosystems. And there is a lot of development at the moment. So roughly there are four types of bridges as we elaborate on, on this slide. And there is also a classification of the various bridges types uh, using this, uh, you know, these uh, types as we mentioned in the, in the previous slide. So um, anything to add here, uh, Manu? Uh, no, I think uh, uh, the, the slides are self-explanatory and uh, uh, for any questions, I think, um, because we so are- let's, let's move on yeah, to Yeah, we have uh, uh, only we have a limited of time. questions uh, in the Moodle forum. Uh, so let's uh, spend the rest of the time um, to elaborate on, on some of the questions. My colleagues uh, have made an excellent job into organizing these questions uh, for me. So uh, I will be sharing um, my screen again, uh, pointing to, uh, to those questions. Uh, can you, sorry, can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Yes, we can see it. Thank you, guys. Um, so uh, first question, um, taking as reference the reading of the blockchain trilemma and the possible scaling solutions of the different blockchains, such as Ethereum um, from proof of work to proof of stake, uh, or the interoperability of the different tokens with the use of bridges. Do you think that mining merge in proof of work together with the bridges could solve the trilemma? Uh, what do you think, Manu, about this one? <laughs> yes, uh, we said about, uh, I, 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 I answered it more or less because I remember this question. 
Yeah, so I said it is trilemma for religion. It's called trilemma for religion because it's so hard to solve uh, right now. And uh, as we saw in the, pre- uh, the presentation, proof of work and, uh, alone, it's a bit weak on that aspect, uh, on uh, some of the aspects, especially on the scalability one. And about bridges, so uh, bridges are not uh, trilemma, uh, are not focusing on the trilemma spar part. So I'm focusing on, on connectivity and interoperability more. Uh, so, or in order to, to formulate other platforms or uh, to have other formations included in applications, but not uh, on scaling solutions. Just to add on, on that, uh, Mano, um, perhaps this question relates to, to the Ethereum uh, uh, 2.0 and the utility of the Bitcoin chain. Uh, which acts mostly as a confirmation layer. Um, and I guess that this indicates like a, a good example of the combination of how proof of work and proof of stake will work together to having uh, an upper layer for fast settlement of transactions. And then you have the slower, let's say, as referring to the Ethereum terminology, the Bitcoin chain uh, as a proof of, you know, uh, as, as, as a proof that the transactions are kind of become more secure and actually set up by the network, uh, which is actually the network that runs the proof of work consensus. Um, so perhaps it relates to that. The second question, um, understand that in layer two transactions are processed off chain and then are registered in bulk every now and then in layer one chain. Why, while I understand how it solves the scalability problem, I do not understand how it solves the blockchain size problem. Um, are all the transactions of layer two compressed or hashed before being uh, inserted in layer one? So what do you think, Manu? Uh, yeah, so first of all, not all, all layer two uh, uh, solutions compressed transactions. Uh, some of them that uh, compressed chain techniques, such as, let's say, uh, roll-up, reduce the on-chain transaction footprint, and um, they are sending, uh, let's say, packages of information in the, in the chain. But uh, other, let's say, uh, layer two generally solve the block um, uh, solve the block size problem by letting all the transactions and conflict happening before submitting the the final results so they're they're easing off the the traffic let's say and they're only putting the final results on it but the final results sometimes are just full and okay so yeah thank you uh also just to know that we will be publishing our responses to the questions uh in the moodle forum just for completeness so uh, layer two, uh, after Ethereum 2.0, I would like to understand if after the update to Ethereum 2.0, if the layer two protocols to ensure scalability will still be needed. Okay. Uh, so basically my opinion, I mean, my response to this question is that Ethereum 2.0 provides a solution to the scalability using a certain architecture okay and this does not necessarily mean that uh, this and we can assume that this is the only possible solution and my take is that um, the uh, if you like to having different layer two solutions will depend on the community on the design requirements of the applications that are supported by such networks for example we can think of applications that are demanding uh, and uh, at the end of the day, each architecture has its own, let's say, upper bound, upper limit of transaction throughput that, that is demanded by, by such applications. And therefore, my answer to this question is that this will depend on what are the needs and requirements of the applications um, that run on top of, 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 of layer two or layer one solutions. We'll only add to that to say that nothing is certain until it's out. And we see what happens, and I'll see, but surely no system is uh, it's perfect. So uh, maybe some s- scaling solution will be needed. Who knows? Exactly. So I will be moving uh, from the insurance protocols because there have been several uh, good answers in the Moodle forum. 
to one question from Basilios with regards to oracles and security. Actually, this is a very good question. Yes, um, yes. Is there a decentralized oracle? Uh, I guess in Ethereum. If not, <laughs> how does Ethereum secure the network from centralized oracles? So uh, just, just a bit of a background uh, for, for all is that the blockchain oracle refers uh, to some outside data source and data feed and how we transfer this data feed to a deterministic blockchain protocol. How do we inject this off-chain data and ensure that with the same input, we will get the same output. And this is the deterministic character of blockchains. Um, just to go back to the solution, uh, sorry, back to the question. Uh, one example that I can think of on top of my head is Chainlink, okay? Chainlink provides a decentralized oracle where a network, if you like, of independent oracles retrieves the data from the data source of chain and aggregates the data. And then each node that participates to this decentralized network of oracles derives um, you know, the common uh, truth about the data point. And therefore they ensure that they will be pushing the right data to the blockchain. So chain link is just an example uh, of solving this uh, oracle, let's say security challenge. There is another question with regards to proof of history versus proof of work. What is the difference between proof of history and proof of work? I noticed that Solana uses it in combination with proof of stake. What are the benefits of using a hybrid approach? I guess that Mano, you, you covered this. Yes, yes, yes. Presentation. Um, accessibility, uh, the DeFi ecosystem is increasingly complex. Do you think that will be a way to make it more accessible to people who doesn't have the technical capabilities to understand its intricacies. Uh, what do you think is the best way to teach all the possibilities with the aggregate layer to make DeFi projects more accessible? Okay, that's a, that's a good one. <laughs> I guess, um, first of all, to bridge the educational gap to those people who are interested in participating to these DeFi products. I mean, uh, an alternative way, let's say, uh, could be the possibility to assign the responsibility of the management of your DeFi investments uh, to some, let's say, uh, regulated or fund management, let's say, company protocol that provides you know, investments in DeFi. Um, So moving, moving forward, um, DeFi connections into this CFI. Uh, what work is being done to better couple the DeFi ecosystem with the current centralized financial ecosystem? Uh, besides yes. all of ramps for fiat, central banks may issue CBDCs, but not on layer ones. Could bridges between the two between um, uh, between the two benefit both ecosystems. That's since we have Labis, I think uh, Labis can elaborate on that uh, yes, Labis. more because he's an CBDC yes. expert. Sure, uh, I'll be more than happy to. So, um, exchanging stable coins and blockchains derivatives are all attempts at connecting traditional finance to crypto. However, as you imply in your question, there are inefficient and expensive ways to do those connections. And I do believe that bridges between traditional finance and D will benefit both systems. CBDCs do have the potential to make those on-ramps more efficient and even provide some feature parity between DeFi and traditional finance. However, how much um, of DeFi will be connected with traditional finance will rely through CBDCs will rely on two factors. First, regulation. And this is very straightforward. There are things happening on DeFi that wouldn't be allowed to happen in traditional finance, especially given the, the current uh, AML and KYC regime. And I don't see that changing anytime soon. And the second has to do with the technology, the technological design of CBDCs. Uh, we know that CBDCs can utilize either DLT or a real time gross settlement system to verify transactions. Um, and depending on the system they choose, there are different ways of connecting them to DeFi with different trade-offs. 
Next week, we will be discussing stablecoins and CBDCs in detail, and we will be perhaps uh, uh, able to answer your question uh, then. We'll also have a very special guest. Uh, so yeah, see you next week for that question. Amazing. Uh, thank you, Lambis. I uh, will be moving uh, forward to the next uh, you know, group of questions since uh, we've seen several responses, one of the responses in the Moodle forum. Um, so uh, Pio is talking creation. Uh, this has to do with the minting process of, uh, you know, uh, the minting process of the tokens uh, or the native token in the blockchain protocol. I guess here, um, if we think of Bitcoin, uh, that is this function that controls the supply until Bitcoin, let's say, hits the hard cap, okay? 21 million coins. So roughly every four years, uh, that depends on several factors, uh, we get this reward uh, slashed in, in, in half. And to incentivize you know, users in maintaining the system, as we, as we explained, newly minted coins are assigned to users that solve the puzzle, et cetera, et cetera. And to come back to the question, uh, I think that we can differentiate between, I think, three kind of categories of minting um, you know, uh, tokens. The first one, is to have those minting process to have this minting process integrated with a consensus mechanism, which is similar to what Nagamoto consensus does. The second uh, kind of uh, way to do it is to have like a fixed cap that is pre-mined, pre-minted, let's say, pre-minted, and uh, decouple the minting process from the actual consensus. And the third type is to assign the new coins uh, to the consensus leader uh, in you know, BFT or POS-like uh, consensus systems. So this, uh, and, 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 uh, and that is also a nice paper that I uh, came to my mind now that I will be pointing people uh, through the Moodle forum to, uh, that explains clearly and uh, with, with great detail uh, the various ways of minting um, tokens uh, in such systems. Um, so next question, could DeFi replace um, bank functionality, Mano? Um, yes, <laughs> that's why it's we- It's a new ecosystem, right? It's a, it's a, it's a kind of a new movement, right? Yes, yes, that's why we do all this course. That's why it's also happening because uh, in uh, in IFF and University of Nicosia, we really believe that uh, DeFi will uh, will re recreate a lot of things, and this is uh, uh, also includes the functionality of the banks and more so, and uh, in, with additional uh, stuff going on. Really short question, really short answer. Yes. <laughs> So I, I skip the next question since we have the Arthur with us um, elaborating and, and discussing Tezos. Uh, the next question is with regards to uh, Cartano and smart contracts on Haskell. So Cartano uses a derivative uh, of Haskell, let's say Plutus here, uh, for smart contracts programming. They claim that using Haskell programs is more secure. Is this correct? What other languages provide similar security? Are there any automated methods that guarantee mathematically that the smart contract has no errors? I think, Manu, that part of this question was answered by, uh, by Arthur as well uh, on his elaboration with regards to uh, formal proofs and uh, ways of, let's say, uh, identifying or simulating the code before deployment in order to reveal any potential bugs. Um, so I guess that this uh, covers this question. Um, I will also be pointing students to, um, uh, to, to a paper that describes, you know, various approaches or on formal verification proofs uh, for, for blockchain, uh, for blockchain developments, etc. Um, so having said that, um, we will be concluding this session for tonight, uh, for today. Uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, I hope that you find this uh, fruitful and I hope that we have intrigued your interest into these topics. Obviously, um, 
the topics that we cover today, uh, there is a vast amount of information that we could cover. Uh, this is just a, a notable sample of, uh, of the information that is out there. So thank you very much and uh, looking forward to see you all uh, in week three. Um, yes, thank you from uh, me as well. And um, uh, feel free to ask me any questions in uh, the Discord. You can find me most of the hours of the day there and I'll be happy to, to try to answer any, uh, any of you. And um, yes, uh, if you Thank haven't you. joined yet, join to the Discord. Uh, the link Lambis has sent in plenty of times. Probably he's writing right now as well. Or you can scan the, um, the QR in the DeFi profile here. Then thank you for me and uh, we'll see you in the, in the next one. Thank you, everyone. You guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.